great feeling. Oh, the best. The best. Yay, turn to being in your 30s. <laughs> wow! Your, your body just goes, you know what? Fuck you. Yeah, I don't need you anymore. I don't need you at all. Uh, hello and welcome to the Blue Rose Cinema Club. I am Crash and Burn. And I am Charlie. And we are here to discuss the king of kings of cinema, the greatest, the latest, the possibly most artistically valid, uh, if you want to get into an argument, uh, the Criterion Collection of Films. Yes, yeah, so that will not cause any arguments at all that this is the artistic merit. But it is a great collection with fantastic films, weird films, and we're here to talk about some that we think people should know about. Yeah, yeah. So we're going we're gonna to try to go through as many as we can before uh, driving ourselves insane, uh, which with some of these films... And even. since you said this, we're going for the King of Kings, we have to start with the King of Monsters. Exactly. We are, we are beginning at uh, where the universe began, for, uh, for me at least. Uh, we are going... To Gojira from 1954, um, quite frankly, one of my favorite films of all time, uh, and uh, I don't respect you unless it's yours as well. It, it is a very, very good film, and uh, at the risk of not wanting to lose respect at this first episode, I also really like it. <laughs> but uh, before we dive into that, uh, we should probably uh, make it clear uh, what we're doing here and why and why you should probably be listening to me, uh, to us. Um, for myself, I am a journalist, uh, I'm a media critic and a multimedia producer, which pales in comparison to you on this subject. Uh, I am a obsessive movie nerd geek. I've been in love with film since as long as I can remember. I was a one of uh, managers of an independent rep cinema for two and a half years i am a filmmaker with multiple shorts and one completed feature and at least another feature that will be lost to the sands of time uh spent over 12 years now working at indie filmmaking goddamn <laughs> and have both uh, metaphorical and literal scars from it. Oh, there you go. So, yeah, pr proof of uh, true professionalship. Uh, it has hurt you and will hurt you in the future. It, it's not a good film unless you bleed slightly for it. There you go. Or a lot for it. Uh, we've been friends for about a decade plus at this point. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah like what, 2006, something like that. Maybe even before that. Around there, yeah, in that in that ballpark. So yeah, in the before times, so long ago. <laughs> and uh, we used to geek out on uh, movies uh, back on the Red versus Blue forum back when you know, like on the internet, you would stick around a single forum, and that would be where you lived. Have you yeah, all it was like your internet home was one website, and <laughs> we have been around, been friends for so long. We watched that site grow from a small. Uh, band of dudes recording in their closets to a multi-million dollar content empire and watched it crash as well so it's been yeah. quite a uh, <laughs> quite a journey we we've been uh friends for so long that people we know uh some of our mutuals are like established industry people shit i'm i'm happy for them <laughs> At the beginning of the year, like we're recording this in 2021, so the second year of the glorious pandemic, mm. and we started talking about we should do a podcast talking about film. Um, I adore the Criterion Channel streaming service. I, I kind of won't shut up about it, how great of a curation and availability of films, and it just kind of grew from there. It's like, I don't think anyone's talking about this group of films. We should. We definitely should, and and after finally, finally, uh, year after year of me needling you to go, hey, let's let's do a show, let's do a show, come on, let's do a show, let's do a show. Finally, finally, thanks to a global crisis, you have no choice but to record with me. <laughs> exactly. So we've uh, we've combined our powers of uh, uh, podcast production and actual 
film career production ooh, uh, into this wonderful show in which we look at uh, the supposed greatest films ever and let you know if eh or eh. yeah. And uh, I am I am usually in the uh, uh, Tarantino mindset of even a bad film. There's usually a lot of stuff in it I will like. There are, it's a very small list of number of films that I outright hate and. There are lots who'll say, it wasn't good, but this bit is worth seeing. Yeah, and the, the truth be told, that's that's what uh, what the real like uh, the gold that you that you mine when you're filming is. It, it's not it's not the greatest film ever. It's never going to always be the greatest film ever. You're going to watch a lot of crap. But did that crap have like an essence of potential goodness, or even just holy shit? What did I just see? Oh, wow! I never in my wildest dreams would have thought of that because it's bad. Yeah, but you did it. And sometimes seeing it done badly is like, oh, so that's why that's not done that way. <laughs> Mistakes were made so that we could all grow. Exactly. And a lot of the, there are quite a few films on the channel that are both maybe not a great film, but they're important because they were the first film to do something. And those are also worth checking out too. Exactly. And like a lot of people wonder, okay, so you're starting with Gojira. Uh, and the entire Toho or a sh a Toho produ produced a Showa era of monster films. That is the films that people usually think of when they consider like cheap kaiju films. Uh, we're talking rubber suits. Um, why on earth would these incredibly cheap uh, and very very cheesy films uh, be in something as uh, uh, pristine and looked upon as uh, the Criterion Collection? And it's because they kind of did it first. It, it doesn't yeah, like how kind of the first gods like the first Godzilla is also even more separate from the Showa era because uh, the first Godzilla tried to be serious and if you go with or Gorgia's the Japanese version is quite a somber and serious film. The next one after that's when they started getting goofy. <laughs> Godzilla rides again. They immediately go to let's have fun with this. <laughs> yeah, I, I really do like that. Uh, they made an immediate hard right turn and kind of stuck with that. It's you know you, you can only do the um, the somber kind of poetic stuff for so long before having to uh, figure it out. And it's it's funny. Um, this is far from the first giant monster movie. King Kong itself came out 21 years before, uh, but it launched a series of not only direct sequels in the form of the Showa uh, era of Toho produ uh, produced kaiju films, which weren't just Godzilla films there were Godzilla films and then there were films that were like in the universe of Godzilla and then there were yeah, films exactly. that were completely un uh, like detached from it but they occurred under the same production budget <laughs> yeah they cuz they had Mothra I believe they had a trilogy of Mothra originally and there was a uh, Rodan and then they all come back in the like later on sequels they keep getting bigger and bigger brawls yeah yeah they, they as the budgets got like, smaller and smaller yeah well exactly and they eventually learned uh, to marvelize things um you don't need to make a uh, a movie for every monster start putting multiple monsters in movies and people will pay for the team-ups uh, i believe we are currently seeing the success of that as uh, uh of course godzilla versus king kong is currently the number one box office on earth by making any money which is more than anything. Well, it's, it's one of the only movies in box office right now. Not in Canada, really, but in the States, it seems to be doing okay. Yeah. I mean, and by okay, we're talking about what would have been an, uh, a truly disastrous embarrassment of a number. Something like under $50 million opening weekend. And the entire industry just went, uh, we're not dead. We can still make money. <laughs> But aside from those, there was also countless rip-offs, coffee, copies, and inspirations by many other companies that uh, essentially just made a cheap generic knockoff of anything, uh, any one of the monsters that they used, and turned it into a uh, uh, their own little, you know, drag down uh, uh, kind of grunge fest. Um, yeah. and, and you mentioned that they're kind of considered uh, the slocky and cheesy and, and they were like the show ones were very corny and very weird but i think uh 
that memory is completely amplified by the American edits that were released that would usually cut down some of the story. In the case of Godzilla, like they inserted an entire other character that is just paid to be there and stand in the corner and have say, uh, my Japanese rusty. Can you tell me what's happening over there in the better shot scene? Right. And, uh, oh my, are we going to get to that? But you're, you're right. Uh, a lot is like stripped and lost in translation. And, um, whereas, uh, those later films essentially just went, yeah, fuck it. You're not going to get the joke. We're not going to put in the effort. Uh, there's a version of the film that we are talking about today. We're, we're actually talking about two, if not two and a half films. Uh, there is a version where they put a lot of effort into it. Um, but first, let's get to the original. Let's get to the classic, to the to the absolute pinnacle of monster films. If you ask me, I'm sorry. Fuck King Kong. <laughs> I would agree. With you. Like King Kong's amazing. There's this is not a knock on King Kong, but if you're gonna go with a giant monster film, Godzilla the classic is the classic for a reason. I would say probably the best out of all of the Showa era as it continued on. They were great. They especially when they got into like really bright technicolor, they looked fascinating, but the original one just has this stark, uh, oppressive bleakness to it that is very good. It, it has a, a, a like a really artistic terror to it, uh, occurring uh, mostly at night, entirely in black and white, and uh, a, a real eye towards don't show the shark. You don't see yeah. Godzilla in this uh, intentionally uh, until late into the film. Um, and half of that is, of course, to hide the effects. But the other half is to just make it even more like terrifying. It's 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 unknowable. It's it's an yeah. Like, it is still a tense and scary film at first. Like it really builds up the the dread of this monster and, uh, because he, Zilla's played is so kind of aggressive and uh, avenging against humanity in this one. Like he, he really is just terror. He shows up. He destroys part of the city and then he just leaves and there's nothing you can do to stop him. It's sort of a uh, unstoppable monster. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's beautiful terror. So yeah, produced in 1954 by Toho Productions, directed by Ishiro Honda, uh, and effects by, of course, Eiji uh, Tsuburaya, the, the incredible designer of all of those little tiny towns with incredible details that then got smashed fantastic um starring haruo uh nakajima apologies to any japanese watchers and listeners my my pronunciation is truly crap uh, i'm very glad i'm leaving this to you and be like uh, i didn't say it wrong oh yeah yeah i would have said it probably worse here it comes uh so haru Her haruo nakajima and katsumi De uh, tezuka as the titular godzillas uh, the the mm -hmm. wonderful men in the uh, the rubber uh, uh, suits and rubber cement was the first one. It was a oh. heavy monster. You're absolutely right. It was like sixty to eighty pounds, and uh, I, I believe it was um, one of the men lost something like twenty pounds in a single day of shooting. Like they would pour it out, like sweat out, and it, it would actually make it heavier because he'd be lugging around liters of sweat. I, I think, didn't uh, he faint inside the suit on the first draft and they had to cut him out and then that's why they have one and a half suits, one that's just legs because it was too heavy to work on its own so they just did the feet stomping and it was like this pair of suspender overalls he would put on Yeah, because the top would be within, too heavy. Yeah, he passed out within like five minutes of uh, using the initial one because um, I believe they had made it of a very porous fiber and it immediately started soaking up not only his sweat but all of the moisture and they're shooting in like the spring in japan there's a lot of moisture yeah <laughs> so yeah and that combined with hot lights in that era it would it would not have been a fun shoot that would have been hell luckier actors are akira takarada uh momoko kochi akihiko 
Hirata and Takeshi Shimura as the now, now cliche cast of noble scientist, endangered family members, and short-tempered military men who seek to understand and then ultimately destroy the enormous titan before it flattens and burns Tokyo. <laughs> and uh, the last one you mentioned, uh, Shimura, who is just incredible and... He's the lead in Seven Samurai. He's worked so much with Kurosawa. It's just incredible that he's in this, what we would call a schlocky monster film. Right. And it's not like something he showed up later on in his career. This was at the same time he was making those films. Right. This is in the middle of an incredible renaissance in Japanese filmmaking um, uh, due to the, uh, uh, finally, the end of uh, American censorship and uh, control of the uh, industry. Uh, you're mm. having... Uh, as you say, Kurosawa is is having his his I wouldn't say his best work, but certainly his breakout work around the same time. And uh, yeah. films that, that are produced at this point set the tone for the Japanese movie industry until today. Yeah, like, they're still considered the top echelon of the filmmaking from them. So it's it's inc very like for a comparison, it would be something like uh, Daniel Day Lewis deciding to show up in Godzilla vs Kong. Yeah, it would be quite a switch. It, it would it would definitely be like, oh damn, he's gonna act the fuck out of this, and then he mostly stands around going like, <laughs> he, he's more the scientist who's sad. He's like, we should save Godzilla, but we can't. But we can't. We have to destroy it. So before we continue, I'm going to give a brief history lesson because you can't enjoy Gojira without understanding the horror that it represents on a fundamental level. Good times with uh, Enjoy is a good word to bring up for this next part. <laughs> so the movie is a reaction to the complex post-war position Japan found itself in, just three years after the official end of the American occupation in which the foreign and domestic policies of Japan were rewritten by the United States, including heavy restrictions on all forms of art and media. Now free from Western censors and control, the Japanese film industry had begun said renaissance. Uh, at the same time, though, they were still very much powerless against American interests in military power. Since 1946, the United States had continued testing atomic and later nuclear weapons in what was called the Pacific Proving Grounds, a 140,000 square mile area in the ocean that includes the beautiful and now highly irradiated Marshall Islands. Ooh. Delightful. Isn't history great? <laughs> it's full of the worst tragedies. Just and and uh, uh, yeah. How do you how do you uh, follow up the Second World War? We're gonna nuke paradise. Yeah. Wonderful. We're not going to nuke where people are. We're just going to nuke where people want to go. Yeah. And actually, I'm sure there were people there, too. Uh, they moved them all and didn't explain to them what was going to happen to their homeland. Oh, well, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, the, the people of the Marshall Islands are still in a big fight with the uh, U.S. Foreign uh, Office. That's horrifying and unsurprising. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Having survived two atomic attacks at the hands of those very American forces, Japanese citizens were understandably uneasy with the continued testing of even more deadly and powerful bombs in former Imperial territory. Tensions and concerns would only escalate following the Daigo Fukuyura Meru, or the Lucky Dragon 5 incident. On March 1st, 1954, the crew of the fishing vessel Lucky Dragon 5 was blanketed with radioactive fallout from the detonation of the Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb. The explosion was over twice the size as intended, and the resulting cloud of radioactive dust quickly swept far beyond the testing grounds. The dust fell on the crew like a warm snow, and by the time they returned to port, all suffered from radiation sickness and burns. By September 1954, crew member Kubuyama Akiishi died from his uh, illnesses and remains to this day the last recorded victim of nuclear war. Ishihiro Honda was always very upfront about his opposition to nuclear war and the intention of Gojira to be a clear stance against the horrors and destruction of the atomic bomb and very much launched the production of this 
within weeks of the Lucky Dragon 5 incident. And the movie opens with uh, eerily similar attack, like the boat that gets first um, sunk by Godzilla unseen on screen. There's a bright flash of light. There's the ship goes down. It, it's this would have been really uh, effective to the audience. Like anyone in Japan watching this would instantly be thinking of the Lucky Dragon incident because it was had just been in the news, and here it is playing out pretty much identically to how they read the description scene in this film. Right. And I like that that incident has carried over uh, to almost every reboot of Godzilla, including that really terrible uh, Matthew Broderick one. It opens with a fishing uh, boat that runs into Godzilla. Uh, I I think it's really a really powerful true story of like, yeah, Godzilla is kind of ripped from the headlines. How insane is that? Yeah, and not only how insane is that, how insane is it that it still, to this day, resonates as powerfully as it did when it first came out? Right? I mean, there's, there's something so so fundamental about it, about such a horror story. Uh, like, you could set that anywhere. You, you, you could make it Lovecraftian uh, so easily. Uh, it, it has, like, hints of uh, Call of Cthulhu in it. Um, it's it's really mesmerizing and terrifying. And of course, that's why the original Gojira is so terrifying because they're trying to reproduce that feeling of, of like helplessness. And you've discovered something remarkable. You, you've you accidentally come across something and it is going to kill you. And it doesn't- Yeah, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You're completely dwarfed by the awesome power of this monster that's been unleashed and there's nothing that anyone can do now. Yeah. And, and so many people, like so much uh, uh, people, so many people in this film and so much of uh, the, the character growth and plot growth is just kind of coming to terms with the fact that there is nothing you can do to stop it. You can try to plan to get people out of its way, but that's it. Nothing will work to end it. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, of course, part of the terrifying concept, like uh, s- something that is lost in reproductions of this is that uh, it ends, of course, with the creation of the Oxygen Destroyer, which is silly sci-fi nonsense. Yeah, but... Right? But it represents... It works as the, as the trying to come up with the ultimate evil that's even worse than nuclear, of we need to stop it by, you know, doing two nuclear bombs kind of thing. It's, let's make something that will make the water toxic, but it will stop this one thing. Yeah, exactly, and like it's it's a, a really nice you know s- a touch on on escalation of technology. Um, obviously, Japan would be like, oh, so you're going to keep building bigger bombs, are you? It's not just this one bomb. You're going to keep trying to make bombs that make that bomb look like nothing. And so the the real message at the end of Godzilla is maybe you shouldn't constantly be trying to make a bigger bomb. Because inevitably there'll be a bigger bomb than that, and we had to use this bigger bomb to stop Godzilla this time. And it's a good thing Doctor Sarazawa's dead; otherwise, he might have to build that bomb again. And of course, yeah, that gets forgotten in all later ones where it's like, "Hey, how about we build an even bigger, uh, uh, you know, vehicle to hit Godzilla with? We hit, we have a, a plane that is the size of three city blocks. We we'll use it to slam into Godzilla. No, fuck that." We will make a Mecha Godzilla. Was it the first Mecha Godzilla aliens, though? It was aliens. I was expecting aliens. There was no aliens. Yeah. <laughs> that would have made Godzilla. I like Godzilla or Kong, Godzilla versus Kong, but I would have liked aliens. Right. I, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm you're all of Earth. Oh. You're you're going ridiculous. Like. Swing for the fences, guys. I mean, there, there's the thing. We're talking about a uh, a series, uh, the, mo- the the modern monster verse, uh, uh, as it's called, um, uh, a series that, in its third film, nonchalantly and kind of offhandedly detonates a nuclear weapon in Atlantis to supercharge Godzilla, and it just kind of gets passed over. People are like, oh yeah, it's whatever. It's an undersea you know, city. And it's like, okay, but it's an undersea city that has a nuclear reactor that is clearly great, uh, you know, like Grecian in design. 
they literally had Godzilla hanging out in Atlantis and then they nuked it. And that's just a thing that happens in this insane film. Yeah, it just kind of, and they don't ever address it again. It's just, it happens and then the movie moves on. <laughs> right? And why don't they just do that more often? Like, oh, you know, oh, oh uh, uh, we need to, su uh, you know, the Godzilla has to fight off this evil robot. Okay, nuke him. Him with a nuke, and then he'll punch faster. Yeah, just give him a power up, and he'll be fine. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> Paint a blue shell on the edge of the nuke and just shoot it at him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, Gojira was an enormous success within Japan. Um, it, uh, uh, I, I won't say it swept their awards, uh, but definitely got like um, it was got one of their of biggest film. box office. I think until Godzilla versus Kong or King Kong versus Godzilla, the that was their next biggest. Right, uh, and that was over uh, a decade later. Uh, this mm. film was immense, but of course only within Japan. Uh, and you know, as as it it slowly was, uh, eventually uh, the foreign film market got their hands on a couple of copies of uh, of Gojira, and suddenly, kind of everyone wanted it. Uh, this this brand new thing from Japan. Which brings us to 1956. Which is, yeah, Godzilla, the king of monsters. Which is... Okay, I'm, I'm going to say a lot of nasty things about this film in the next little while, so I want to start off saying it's not bad. It is actually quite good. It is worth seeing. But it's worth seeing if you've seen the original, because the original is light years better. It's just the original's uh, this use word is overused far too much, but it's a masterpiece. It's amazing. It's fantastic from start to finish. It has a great story, great moral, great message, and the American one strips pretty much all of that out. It's just uh, Steve Martin wakes up and starts <laughs> narrating the film. It's a, it's a Richard Burr? Yeah, so uh, Raymond Burr. So uh, that's it. <laughs> let's start from the beginning on on that one, because yeah, like uh, uh, Steve Martin wakes up and it's like not not who you're thinking, old comedy nerds. Uh, yes, it's not that Steve Martin. It's a character <laughs> named Steve Martin. So yeah, uh, no ba no dueling banjos with Godzilla. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the American uh, distribution rights to Gojira were purchased in 1955 by film producer Edmund Goldman uh, for a grand total of $25,000. Big money. Big money. Yeah. Woo. Uh, unlike Even back then, that's still pretty cheap. I know, right? Like, he's essentially just buying it to, uh, to show it around Hollywood a few times to see if anyone had any interest in it. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's an optioning right, not, not actually distribution. Uh, and uh, unlike most like distribution and localization deals, though, Goldman and Toho came to an agreement that would see the film's cast expanded, the plot refocused with extensive reshoots, and the film's structure fundamentally changed to better match Western tastes. To accomplish this, Honda and Toho worked closely with Goldman's chosen production team and director Terry o. Morse to both maintain the quality of the original film eh, and to find to, to American audiences. Eh. <laughs> With an additional $125,000 budget for reshoots, in, uh, inserting Raymond Burr's uh, journalist uh, character Steve Martin as the protagonist, Godzilla King of Monsters was released in 1956 and was an instant classic, uh, though much reviled by critics at the time and super fans of the original Gojira cut, as you were saying, because fuck this film in many ways. <laughs> Yeah, it, it really, it takes out all of the like, emotional depth, the kind of heavy ideas of pacifism versus anti-war versus pr progressing technology, all of that stripped away. It's just this American reporter stopped off in Tokyo, got caught up when a giant lizard attacked, reports on it, and spends the majority of the movie... Uh, kind of following the plot of the original film where he'll enter a room through a doorway that looks quite a bit like the door on the set in the other film 
and then goes and stands in the corner with his military handler who then just translates what's happening in the film that's happening just off screen it's mm -hmm. it's quite weird to watch when you know where they've added in stuff because like oh cool so that's that's reshot that's original film reshot reshot yeah body double body double pretty sure that's a guy in drag because they couldn't get a japanese woman of the same height uh, probably uh, and there's like and the the most noticeable i thought was the big attack on the city where Burr is in the middle of it and is recording uh, an audio book recorded to send back to America. This is what's happening. I hope you get this message. And there's a shot where Godzilla kicks in a building. And then there's a shot of Burr falling to the ground with a two by four on his back <laughs> and some dust sprinkling around him. And then it cuts back to the building collapse. You know, like this is not the same. That cost one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and I feel that most of it went into Raymond Burr's pocket, because it sure as fuck didn't go into production. I, I hope he was paid well. I, I I believe he was. I mean, you know, it, it's definitely one of those weird ones where um, Raymond Burr's like a so-so a uh, name of old Hollywood. Um, you you vaguely know him. You go, yeah, that sounds about right. And he's got a very Hollywood e name, right? Mm-hmm. And to hear that, oh yeah, and he was in the first Godzilla, like the, the first Godzilla that you would have in the Western market, it just kind of breaks your brain a little. It, it, it's an odd choice, and he, it's clear he didn't care, because his performance is pretty line deliveries not uh, there's not a lot of emoting behind it i i don't i don't know he does a really really good performance in that one scene where he asked the japanese guy next to him what's happening that was a really unique uh line is delivery. that the first or fifth time he does that uh i want to say the eighth or ninth okay <laughs> but it's the one where he's just like my japanese rusty and you can see his eyes drift off and he's clearly looking to the trailer where his he can just be like can i go yeah. oh there's the craft services table huh it's looking good i could get a coffee before they finish this line <laughs> i could probably hide it you know behind my back out of shot it'd be great Fantastic. Pretty much all shots of him are from like waist up anyway. They're just like close ups and mid cuts where it's just like he's over there. Like it's shot it, it's shot so high up on him. Even if he was wearing those really super high waisted pants that people had then, he could be without pants right now. We could be watching this and he's not wearing pants. I want yeah. Raymond Burr to have pants on, damn it. Uh and I, it's, I guess I guess it worked out though in the end because this film uh, uh, just this cut of the film, uh, unlike other recuts, was very profitable. <laughs> it's uh, well. It, I would also, if I saw this one, well, I did see this one first when I was a kid. I saw this one and I thought it was amazing. It was great. It wasn't until I was much older that I saw the original cut and I was like, "Oh, that's a really good film." Yeah, that yeah, it kind this of. Is, this is not just a fun film that is fun. You know, like it, it, it's good and fun to watch. Uh, Gojira is a painful uh, reminiscence on the futility of existence, and this is about smashy monster blow up boom. Yeah, it it, it also like reframes some of the action. Like, there's a couple of the attacks in the American version; they just sort of come out of nowhere. It, it felt like in the original Japanese version, they build up to them they're worried that he's coming they're tracking him like it's a is he going to go to this part of the island or this part like it, it has a lot more suspense and then when he actually does appear there's a sense of dread of like this is what they're planning for and they didn't plan <laughs> like it's yeah it, it, it's, it's it's a lot more random in the american cut well exactly it, it uh the, the japanese one is talking about like uh expectation of the japanese character when it comes to like political reaction when it comes to military reaction when it comes to like 
the way that they as a nation would respond to these kinds of things at the same time and the helplessness that they felt more or less uh, following the loss in the war. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, the American one doesn't have time for any of that subtlety. And quite frankly, uh, most of its audience would have been uh, uh, heavily aligned against the Japanese uh, just 20 years before, or uh, 10 years before. And so would be unlikely to be interested in heavily sympathizing with Japanese characters or bothering to be familiar with aspects of their culture that kind of shine through in this. Yeah, it's a very good point. Like the film does have, with Burr narrating so much, he's saying, oh, here I'm at this island, I'm seeing a ancient dance that they don't do anymore. And in the film, the classic, it makes sense. This is something they do on the island to honor their spirits. Here, it's just like, oh, isn't this like a quirky local tradition? It's yeah, it, uh, it's all very white. But I'm just like, oh, it's a another dancing. Very much so, but it, uh, pro as you mentioned, though, from the time people's attitude in America, especially, we're not kind to the Japanese people. So it probably cushioning that aspect well it hurts the film was what made it accessible at the time no oh, absolutely and uh my god was it ever accessible i mean okay this this number is small relative to now but it made two million dollars a an unknown film from japan in 1956 made two million dollars at a time when which it cost a quarter yeah, and uh, also like it's there is still only one white character in the film. It is still a, they can't get around the fact that every other character is Japanese. That was a pretty big deal back then for to get two million dollars. It is impressive, let's say. Right, I believe I believe the number that they said was uh, it ended up it was so successful that it was the most the most successful Japanese film in America to date, and within the four top successful foreign films of all time at that moment. Um, despite starring Raymond Burr, a uh, Canadian uh, uh, born uh, American actor, it was still considered a foreign film. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Yeah. Glad to see Hollywood change so much. Yes, yes, truly. God, it seems just yesterday, Scarlett Johansson was getting all those great Asian American roles. Well, she had to take some away from Emma Stone. Uh, uh, but did you know there is actually a third version of this film? And no, I will not make you watch it, though you may want to. I did not. I'm terrifyingly intrigued. It is called called uh, Godzilla. In 1977, Italian filmmaker Luigi Cosi purchased the rights to the 1956 version of this film. He wanted the original version, uh, the, the 1954 version, but Toho doesn't want anyone to touch that. It's, it is, it's a masterpiece. No, if you want to fuck Yeah, with Toho it, is really hard to work with I, for any studio. I bet, like, like they worked once to make King of the Monsters and that was it. The rest of the time, they're like, no, no, you you come to us. We don't come to you. Uh, and so I guess this was actually the second time that they were okay-ish uh, working with other people because they, they handed over the rights to the 1956 cut and said, do what you want. We don't care. Have fun. And the resulting uh, Kazi cut uh, has been extensively edited, which includes colorization of the entire film Oh, God. On an artistic merit, not realistic. Intriguing. Yeah, so the colors kind of shift. It it looks like you're watching an old, like a really, really old film that was colorized, and then you're watching it on, like, an old CRT uh, TV that is on a different channel and just kind of getting this one. The colors are a fucking mess. Um, they swapped out the soundtrack for a synth variation <laughs> from soundtrack, which gives it this really bizarre, ethereal, but brutal kind of uh, the edge of a saw or a rusty saw 
but if that edge of a rusty saw was ethereal in some weird way. You're actually making me want to see this. Like, oh yeah, I, and spliced in footage of real life events of death and destruction. What? Yeah. What? And this this Why? was released and was quite popular in uh, uh, Europe throughout the late seventies. How do you get this? Like, I, I want to see this now. It's on YouTube. <laughs> oh, a okay. Very terrible copy of it on YouTube. I don't want to see that in pristine quality. That that needs to be seen in bootleg grainy version. Yeah, that is uh, C O Z Z I Kazi Kazilla. Okay, Senor Steve Martin. See. Si. Enjoy that. All right. That I don't know if "enjoy" is the right word, but I am definitely intrigued to check it out. <laughs> and and I guess that's the best that we can hope with uh, here at uh, Blue Rose Cinema Club is to intrigue people into checking some of these films out because some of them are really fucking out there. Um, the next movie we're going to be talking about is Chasing Amy, which is less out there and more just, it's a Kevin Smith movie that's in the Criterion Collection. It's a Kevin Smith movie, it's in the Criterion Channel that uh, I am very excited and very terrified to revisit it because uh, for me personally, Kevin Smith was definitely one of the reasons I became a filmmaker as cliched and <laughs> embarrassing as it is to admit that but I was that kid who watched Clerks and was like oh, I can do this like they're talking about Star Wars I understand like I can be a filmmaker I can do it if he can and then you see Jason Amy in the Criterion Collection like this is amazing and progressive and I I am looking forward to revisiting it and thinking how dated it will be. Yes, how, how incredibly painful this is going to be for all of us. All yes. of us. <laughs> well, thank you so much for listening. If you have a comment or question for us about the films we watched, if you have a film you want to suggest for us to watch, or if you just want to talk to us, please send us an email here, or the email address will be in the podcast notes. Please like, share, and subscribe. And uh, the more that you, you tell us how, uh, how we are, the more you tell, you know, uh, the, the better we get. Uh, so give us comments. Leave us comments in the comments. Leave us comments in the comments about our comments. comments. Yeah, this, is, this is the first show. We will get better. Probably. <laughs> Maybe. But I don't promise that by episode two, Facing <laughs> Amy. Thank you so much for watching. We promise that next episode we will probably be a little bit better, but then again, it's Chasing Amy, so... Being better is not a guarantee. That's that's probably actually the show's slogan now. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>